Hello and welcome to another edition of the Mayor Dan Plutko Show. I'm very pleased to have as my guest today a new member of our Dearborn Heights family, Major Jim Mervin, who is affiliated with the Salvation Army on Warren Avenue. So, Major, thank you for being a guest on my show. Thank you for letting me come over. It's nice to be here. It's nice to get the opportunity to meet people in the community. And we are very pleased. Uh, so often, the Salvation Army has done a lot of assistance to our residents and residents in the metropolitan area. You do such great work, and, and I think we probably ought to give a little background because the Salvation Army has a couple different roles that it sees that it plays. And can you describe what those roles are and how you help the, uh, the community, but also do a spiritual side to this? Sure, we'd be glad to. You know, most people recognize the Salvation Army here in the United States as uh, a large social service agency. They'll recognize us for our thrift stores. Uh, oftentimes people associate us with the red kettles at Christmas time, and uh, that's certainly important because without that funding, we can't do what we do throughout the year in terms of helping people, whether it's uh, helping with utilities, keeping their lights and the heat going, uh, whether that's helping with food or emergency shelter, all of that is uh, uh, funded through our red kettle drives at Christmas time and through donations of people that help us throughout the year. Uh, what oftentimes uh, eludes people uh, here in the States is, is why we do what we do and, and what our origins are. We, we actually do this because we are a church. We are part of the uh, universal Christian church, meaning universal worldwide. We are part of uh, the church around the world. Um, we actually had our starting in 1865, so 151 years ago in London, England. Uh, our founders were uh, um, William and Catherine Booth. William was a uh, an itinerant Methodist minister. Uh, and if you recall your history uh, around the uh, uh, mid-1800s, of course, in this country, uh, we were going through the uh, Civil War. Uh, elsewhere, we were going through the Industrial Revolution. And so uh, there really wasn't that uh, middle class that you and I now know mm -hmm. and enjoy so much. Uh, there were two classes. There were the, the, the wealthy and the shop owners, and then there were the laborers. And quite frankly, there was a, there was a huge divide between. And uh, uh, William uh, found that a lot of the people that uh, he was ministering to were coming out of that working class, but simply didn't have enough funds to, uh, to even put a roof over their heads. And uh, he felt compelled to do something about that. And uh, uh, at that time, the Methodist church wasn't quite as involved, didn't want to go quite as far as he did. And he said, you know, I... Uh, I get that. I need to do something separate. And so he said, I I'm going to um, break away uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, do what I feel God is calling me to. Never in his wildest imaginations did he think that he would start uh, his own church. Never did he think that he would wind up with an international organization. But here we are 151 years later in 123 countries around the world doing uh, social services. Uh, our motto uh, is heart to God, hand to man, and uh, that's, uh, that's what drives us to do what we do. We really believe with all of our hearts, if we're going to be the people that God has called us to be, it's impossible not to help our neighbors. It's impossible not to hand out that cup of cold water in His name. And, and so that's why we do what we do. We would never say, oh, you're hungry. Come on in. Let me have a word of prayer with you, and while we're praying for you, I'll have my staff load your car with uh, groceries. We would never say to somebody, well, your lights aren't on, come on in and, and let me uh, pray with you, and while I'm praying and reading scripture with you, uh, I'll have my staff call the uh, uh, utility companies, we'll get the lights turned back on. That's, that's not who we are, that's not how we do business, but that's the motivation behind what we do. We believe that God cares deeply Mm -hmm. about people and, and we need to do the same. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I had the opportunity, um, this was a few years ago, but uh, you have as part of your congregation a significant band and I went for some Christmas carols during a uh, Christmas season and still have the CD that I received, but the music was uh, just unbelievable. It's mostly horns and, and um, but how does that incorporate, but in my mind, that's part of the Salvation Army. Very much so. It, it's interesting how that all comes about. Again, this comes back to our roots over in London, England, 
where uh, so many of the people who were coming to worship with the Salvation Army worked in factories. And a lot of the factories during that time frame had their own brass bands. And so people would take their uh, cornets, they'd take their trombones, they'd take their, their baritones to, uh, to work with them. And if they couldn't afford their instruments, the companies would buy those. And then on their coffee breaks, during their lunch breaks, uh, they'd have all this music practice and uh, all that sort of stuff. Also one of the things that they did during that time, the companies would help these bands then wear uniforms. And if you stop and think about that, at that time it was very important to be recognized as being a part of a group and so this this whole idea of being uniformed and playing uh, a brass instrument was was pretty common practice in the UK interestingly enough our founder William Booth didn't want to have anything to do with brass music in uh, in the Salvation Army uh, it was another gentleman that came in uh, by the last name of Fry uh, who convinced the uh, the general that uh, no no that really is a good thing and so eventually William Booth came to his senses and he said, wow, why should the devil have all the good music? So he brought in the, ba the brass and here we are. Uh, and and uh, uh, largely it's uh, around the globe now that the Salvation Army is recognized as the uh, world's largest producer of music. Uh, so uh, it's very much a tradition. The, uh, the uh, Salvation Army Dearborn Heights Citadel Band uh, just celebrated their 95th consecutive uh, Thanksgiving concert and uh, so it's very big uh, not only in the Salvation Army it's huge to the families that are a part of that and uh, uh, for us it's not only uh, an avenue of entertainment it is a form of worship um, uh, we don't have an organ where we're at now uh, we use the the brass band to accompany us in our singing to, to move us into worship uh, and just at Christmas time, we were invited to, to go out into the park and help some other people uh, bring in Christmas with the uh, carol. So it's very important to us. Oh, it was fantastic. I still have fond memories of it and uh, uh, just kind of always have equated the two. But uh, yeah, the music was fantastic and added to the whole uh, worship. So that was uh, uh, a real credit to the band. I still remember that. I, love music and, and it just, uh, I thought that was, was great. A uh, couple things that I don't know if our residents are aware of, but like uh, my, uh, um, we do have a emergency preparedness director, Bob Ancrap, and Bob has uh, worked very closely with the Salvation Army because you also in cases of disaster have trucks and other things that you have made available and we hope that we never have to utilize those things, but in disasters, you are there. And um, irrespective of a person's faith, uh, irrespective of, of color, anything else, you're there to serve humanity, and uh, it's, it's a real compliment to your, your church and your organization. Well, thank you. The, uh, the emergency disaster services team that uh, we have here, uh, headquartered out of our divisional headquarters office uh, in uh, Southfield is actually headed up by our bandmaster that you were oh, just speaking really? of. Uh, so Chuck McDougal does a fantastic job not uh, not only here in our area but across the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the entire division and um, you're right we never want to use that service but when it's there uh, when it's needed we are so glad that uh, we have Chuck and his team of volunteers uh, and, and, and I have to emphasize that, volunteers yes. that, that roll out any time of the day, uh, any season, uh, to help people in need. Um, uh, I've been called out uh, to, to work on those canteens, uh, both locally and uh, at some of our uh, major disasters throughout the states. Uh, and it really is humbling to be able to stand with somebody in their time of need um, and assure them that uh, uh, life goes on. Assure mm -hmm. them that God sees what's happening in their life and that God cares about what's happening and, and, and then begin to pull their lives back mm -hmm. together. That's, uh, that's just an incredible opportunity, again, that we have to be of service. Not because uh, anybody demands it, not because uh, uh, any other reason other than the fact that we want to be there uh, to share God's love, God's help, God's concern with, with people in need. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of uh, outside the season, but I always uh, encourage people to uh, contribute to the Red Kettle Fund. And I know from about Thanksgiving to Christmas, you do a lot of fundraising. 
Uh, and I've participated in some of it. In fact, on my desk, I still have a little red bell, uh, kind of a miniature one that, yes. that I received and very honored to have that on my desk. But uh, uh, we remember that um, originally um, when the Salvation Army decided to come in, uh, a lot of people didn't understand the church, didn't understand the organization, were a sure. little bit actually uh, some of the people were kind of reluctant to have the Salvation Army came in. And those of us that had um, uh, knew the good works that you did said, oh, oh no, the, this is going to be a great organization to have. And I have, uh, even though there was, uh, I'd just been on either the city council or mayor for a long year, so I know how some of this all developed. Yeah, right. But no one has ever, ever said anything but a good word to the Salvation Army, and we're so pleased that you're part of the Dearborn Heights family because of all the good things you do. Uh, I know that you run uh, summer programs uh, th through the church, uh, a lot of things, and you open that up to the community, and it's just great, all the different uh, programs you have there. We have a tremendous staff that uh, work hard. You know, my job is easy. I get to uh, dress in this uniform and, and uh, look uh, look handsome and, and go out and promote the Salvation Army. It's my staff that's back at the office that's uh, working diligently, uh, helping people with their utility bills, helping them with the food that they need, uh, helping them in the community center. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our whole goal behind providing the uh, summer day camp that you just referenced is to help working families have a safe place for their children to go. Uh, and the idea is not just to have it when it's convenient for us. A lot of uh, summer day camps run in hours that are, you know, 9 to 3, 9 yep. to 4 kind of thing. But uh, we want to be there early in the morning uh, and then uh, after uh, hours so that uh, families have a way of knowing that their children are being taken mm -hmm. care of, knowing that uh, they'll have a, uh, not only a safe place but a fun place uh, to, to uh, uh, be uh, involved in activities that are going to keep them um, engaged and uh, allow them to grow. So we, we just have a, a tremendous time. And of course, as you said, uh, that's open to the community. Very few of our congregation take a part of that. Part of that is uh, their children aren't of those ages right now. Yeah. Uh, so it is open to the community and we love to see people come. You know, one of the great pleasures I have, uh, we have a large parking lot and uh, when I come uh, to the office uh, either uh, late in the afternoon or in the evening, I'll see our neighbors coming over with their children uh, and they'll they'll have uh, basketballs with them they'll have uh, their uh, um, skateboards that sort of thing and and I, I enjoy watching people use our property mm -hmm. uh, and make certain that they have a great time uh, know that we're a safe place to be mm -hmm. now uh, we've had since I've been mayor I think you're the third or fourth uh, leader of the the church there uh, so you travel around you're uh, we learned prior to the show that you're uh, originally from Winnipeg. I am. And so uh, how did you get from Winnipeg to Dearborn Heights, Michigan? Actually, my family's from Winnipeg, <clears throat> and uh, 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 I came down to the States, uh, uh, boy, probably 76 was the first time that I came down to the States, and uh, uh, then I went uh, back to Toronto to go to school. Uh, uh, it, while I was here in 76, my wife and I uh, were married. Uh, my wife is from the States. Uh, we went back to uh, Toronto eventually. Uh, pardon me, actually we went out to Calgary first. I was an engineer in those days. And a uh, funny story, when uh, we went out to Calgary, uh, my wife coming from the States uh, said, you know, where we're going, it doesn't get too terribly cold, does it? And I said, well, <laughs> yeah, it does. And she said, it doesn't stay cold for very long, does it? And I said, yeah, it does. And uh, she says, so why are we going? Remember, I was an engineer in those yep. days. I said, to make money. She said, okay, that's fine. We'll be fine. So we moved out in October. Calgary in October is gorgeous. It's wonderful. Uh, but December 1st, it dropped down to minus 40. <laughs> stayed there until January 1 when we had a heat wave. and went all the way back up to minus 39. So she wasn't very impressed. But that whole time, we were involved with the Salvation Army as our church. Uh, she was a school teacher. I was an engineer. And uh, eventually the company that I was with asked me to uh, move out to uh, Toronto and uh, I was heading up a, a brand new product. Uh, we were rolling out a, a new product that the world had never heard of. It was called, are you ready for this? Yep. It's called email. 
<laughs> so uh, unfortunately, that's how old I am. And uh, uh, while we were doing that, we were working with the, the major banks, major corporations in Canada and around the globe. And uh, during that time, my wife and I both felt that God was calling us to do something uh, different with our lives. And uh, uh, long story short, uh, we wound up coming back to the United States. Uh, uh, both my wife's parents and my parents were Salvation Army officers at the time. Uh, we wound up uh, entering the training college for officers in Chicago. And uh, from that time, we've just been moving around uh, mm -hmm. the, the central 10 United States area uh, and have uh, never worked longer hours, never worked harder, and never been paid any less or enjoyed anything more than what we're doing right now. That's great. That's yeah. great. I must ask you on temperature because uh, oftentimes I'll listen to CKLW and uh, there's a different, Canada uses a different thermometer that we do. So I think today they announced it was eight and it was going up to 10. Right. And here we would say 50 degrees. So right. when you were saying minus 40 or 39, you're talking Celsius. Celsius. But okay. now here's, here's the good news or the bad news at minus 40, uh, minus 40 Celsius and minus uh, Fahrenheit meet. And after that, they kind of separate exactly. again. So minus, minus 40 in anybody's temperature is cold. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. I think it's 32 degrees. Everything meets, and then it's positive and negative. Yeah. Uh, it's, and that's one of the things, because I have numerous employees who, uh, since we're so close to the border, that either were Canadian, had one or both parents Canadian. So there's a lot of uh, uh, Canadians' uh, ancestry, if you will, but... Uh, luckily, the uh, the language is the same, and I, I find it interesting when I listen to the CKLW. Uh, there's articles that Canadians don't use, and and so they'll say, "I'm going to hospital," rather than here we would say, "I'm going to the hospital." They don't they drop that. It's like, and it's kind of redundant, or not redundant, but kind of an extra word that you don't need. Quite frankly, it still throws me off. Uh, even when I write, I'll, I'll I'll write the way that I speak, and so I'll say I'm going to hospital to visit somebody, or I'll uh, I'll ask people if, if they'd like a coffee. I think here you'd say, "Would you like a cup of coffee?" Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, there are things like that a that throw me off. Little subtleties, but it's not impossible, and it's just uh, Canada's a great place to visit and great people, and I've always. Uh, enjoyed all my time uh, that I've spent up in Canada and mostly vacation time. It's been great. There are times, I must admit, that my, my uh, ASL, American as a Second Language, is weak and it gets me in trouble. Uh, but by and large, we're, we're pretty much the same. There, yeah. the, the, the people that I work with, the, my staff, uh, the people in our congregation will, uh, will say that there are still a, a few words that I don't say quite properly. And <laughs> I always remind them uh, to be patient, that, uh, that we'll get the victory yet. And one of these days, uh, uh, the United States will realize uh, just how important Canada is. And uh, when we take over your country, you'll be fine with it. <laughs> well, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's so great that uh, they have such a neighboring community. And even though uh, one needs to get through customs to get through, but quite frankly, um, there is so much in common that uh, it's just unbelievable. Uh, government's a little bit different, parliament and, 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 and the lawmaking and uh, loyalty to the queen, which we don't have here, but uh, it's, it's, it's great. Well, one of the things that, uh, that we've enjoyed about being in this country is learning uh, how the government is run, understanding what that's all about. Uh, in our last appointment, uh, we were very involved with uh, uh, the mayors of both city. We were in uh, Lafayette, which uh, of course is right on the Wabash River. So you had Wabash West. Oh, in Indiana. Uh, yeah, so we had Lafayette, West Lafayette, uh, two different cities, two different mayors. Uh, we were very involved with our state legislature uh, in, uh, in trying to make differences in, in people's lives. And that's one of the reasons that I was so glad uh, to come and be a part of uh, today's program. Uh, so that uh, we can get back out in the community, get to know uh, mm -hmm. uh, people and, and let people know who we are so that mm -hmm. when there is that time of need, uh, they'll be able to place a, a face with, uh, with the Salvation Army. Unfortunately, it's this face that they've got to put with the Salvation Army, but, you know, we're here to help, mm -hmm. and uh, that's, uh, that's what we love doing. Um, and, and we're just uh, thrilled to be a part of this community. You know, uh, my wife and I were appointed, uh, first of all, in, in Pontiac a few years ago, and then from Pontiac we went over to uh, Plymouth, and uh, so we are familiar with the area. Matter of fact, uh, occasionally we would come over to this Dearborn Heights location for different services, different programs. Never in our wildest imagination did we think that we would be appointed here. And uh, so when we moved back uh, to this area in July, 
Uh, there was a strange kind of uh, deja vu all over again, but maybe for the first time because we weren't really a part of this neighborhood. And uh, now as we've gotten into uh, this whole area, trying to figure out what the needs of the community are, trying to figure out how the Salvation Army can respond to those needs, uh, it's been wonderful. And it's, what's really been good is to see how people have welcomed us uh, have allowed the Salvation Army to be a part of the community mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to continued relationships uh, mm -hmm. it, to, to further the ministry of the Salvation Army to people uh, in need. You know, our, our, our motto, uh, our mission statement is to meet human needs in the name of Jesus Christ without discrimination mm -hmm. and, and that's what we do each and every day. Um, I said a few moments ago and I, I want to come back to this, uh, I'm privileged to have a great staff who is uh, just tremendously dedicated uh, to that mission and to the uh, people of this community. And uh, without them, uh, uh, we wouldn't have a reason for existing. And if it weren't for the people here who either support us or need us, um, there'd be no need for us to be here. It's when all of those come together uh, that this community is really served. Mm -hmm. You said it well, and uh, you have my personal support in anything I can do to assist. And uh, if nothing else, for all the good things you've done for residents in Dearborn Heights as a group, and so I'm there to uh, help you. I must ask you, uh, since you spent time down in Indiana, how did the word Hoosier came from? Did anybody <laughs> tell you? Because I, I like auto racing. I go down there, and I, I've heard all kinds of goofy stories as to how, but nobody knows exactly what a Hoosier is. So. Nobody seems to know. I, I don't know what it is. I'll, I'll give you another expression that they use that, quite frankly, I had never heard of, uh, and I've used it once or twice since I've been here, and, and people look at me and they go, what on earth does that mean? They have an expression that says, if, if we're going to think about something for a while, uh, they're going to noodle on it. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't know what noodling meant, and uh, they could tell that this poor Canadian was lost when they used that term. <laughs> and so, frankly, they they helped me understand that I've used that once or twice here, and now now my staff every now and then will throw that in. They'll say, "Well, Major, let me noodle on that for a while." Yeah. So whether it's noodling or or uh, uh, the idea of what a hooser is, I'm lost. <laughs> yeah, that's a good state, and. Uh... Uh, so now you're in the, uh, you went from the boiler up uh, area to the Big Ten to uh, uh, U of M, Wolverines, and Spartans territory. So you're welcome. Thank you. You know, I, I have to be very careful there. Our son uh, is still finishing off his uh, degree uh, at Purdue. And so uh, when uh, uh, Purdue was doing so well in the uh, playoffs here, uh, it was a boiler up, hammer down. And yeah. uh, of course, people that are in our congregation, people that I work with, uh, uh, we have some that are uh, uh, gold green and others are gold blue, and so yep. I'm just silent on that whole yeah. issue. <laughs> good, uh, good decision. Uh, although, in uh, and, and uh, I like to go to uh, occasional away games for football, and so um, biggest uh, drum I think in the world is yes. down there in Purdue. So that was uh, I got to see that in this beautiful campus, and everybody was very nice to us, even though my team won. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're, once again, I want to, uh, uh, and we might have you back as it gets closer to your fundraising, so we can, uh, we'd be more than happy to do any kind of uh, pitch we can, because one of the things that sometimes in organizations you can give money and you're really not sure how it's being utilized, I, w I would dare say that based upon all the volunteers and everything, probably 99%, if not 100% of every contribution that goes in the kettle goes, comes back to the community in the form of service and care and aid to to the families in the surrounding Detroit area. And that you can't say that about a lot of charitable organizations. And I've, uh, if one is looking to make a contribution, you're a great organization to do it. And I, I uh, will have you back when it when those times come and we'll try to see if we can uh, help fill a couple of those kettles for you. That would be wonderful. Thank you. We yeah. certainly need the help and uh, uh, again it's not for us. It's for the people right. that are in need and uh, you know one of the uh, one of the joys that I get to see day in and day out with my staff is to see how lives are changed and uh, when you see lives that are changed uh, it makes all the difference in the world and it, it really 
uh, gives you a reason for wanting to do what you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're thankful for the people who entrust their uh, hard-earned cash to us to be able to help people in need. Uh, we're thrilled to see people that come to us in their uh, darkest hour of need, uh, to see them get back on their feet and, and, and continue to be strong members of our community. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, uh, uh, that's something you just can't put a price tag mm -hmm. on. Well, Major Jim, uh, welcome to our Dearborn Heights family. We look forward to working with you on great projects that will be to the benefit of Dearborn Heights residents. And to our audience, uh, thank you for watching another edition of the Mayor Dan Pletko Show.